Well, let's go ahead and get started. A little after 10, but uh, yeah. So glad you're all here. Welcome. Uh, my name's Dan Clark. I am the director of the Local Government Center, and I've been invited here to provide this board training. It's not a boring training. Got to be clear, it's going to be a board training. And uh, so hopefully all of you are here at the right spot, intending to be trained and instructed on serving on boards. Uh, so first, my first question for all of you, oh, let me tell you where I'm from. So I'm from Montana State University. Anybody hear of that place? All right. <laughs> it's always nice to come to Missoula. All right, so uh, well, I'm with the Local Government Center. I'm the director of the Local Government Center over in Bozeman. The center's been around for about 30, uh, 30 plus years, about 35 years. And uh, our mission is to build the capacity of local governments across the state of Montana through technical assistance, research, and training. So being here today, work with you, is part of our, uh, meeting our mission. And we work across the state with cities and counties, uh, appointed elected boards. Uh, we do a tremendous amount of training, a lot of strategic planning for those of you that might uh, uh, serving on a board that are looking for some, some way to come together and unify around a, a, some sort of a goals and mission. We do a lot of that type of work. We do this type of work. Uh, and then work with elected officials. So we do a lot of trainings for uh, mayors, city councils, and county commissioners. Um, so that's a little bit about who I am, what we do. A, a little bit about me personally, I've been with the center for uh, a little over eight years. I've been in Montana for a little over 20 years. And, uh, oh, and, and I served, I served as the mayor of the city of Shoto. Anyone know where that's at? Wow. Yeah, so I, my arm is still sore from being twisted. Uh, to do that, but I had a wonderful time, wonderful experience serving as the mayor of that, that small community. I was also the county extension agent, so I had, I couldn't go to the grocery store without spending two hours. People either yapping me to me about their garden or about their crops or about potholes. So, so my wife stopped sending me the, to the grocery store to get milk, but great experience. So that's kind of where I come from. I've been uh, working in small rural communities all over the state uh, for most of my career here in Montana, so I understand uh, Montana understand the local governance pretty well and so my hope is today that we can cover uh, all the inf uh, material that I have planned which is hopefully the same things that you're here to learn. Um, so f my first question then is how many of you have gone through one of my board trainings before? Raise your hand. Wow, just keep coming back. <laughs> all right, so hopefully we can wow you some more with new material. There's not much new but we'll, we'll see. How many of you are, are newly appointed to serving on a board? All right, it's quite a few of you. All right, how many of you uh, are on a county board? About half, and then I'm assuming the rest of you are city boards? We don't know. You don't know? You, you just, who, who appointed you? Do you know who appointed you? Who? The, the county? I know that, that. <laughs> Yeah, that bagel got in there pretty quick, didn't it? <laughs> All right. So city, county boards, and then uh, uh, and, and maybe we can talk a little bit about administrative boards versus advisory boards. Uh, really, as you can see, I do not have a PowerPoint. Yay. You're welcome. Uh, so I'm not going to kill you with the PowerPoint. So this is going to be very dynamic. Uh, I am going to follow and cover whatever you want to talk about. So we're going to have you think here in just a minute, uh, or be thinking now, and we'll put them up here on the board. What is it that you want to learn? What do you want to know? For some of you, this is the first time you're serving on a board, a public board. This is different than serving on a nonprofit board or a community board. And so we want to make sure you understand what are those statutory and constitutional responsibilities that you have as a board member to make sure that you're meeting your obligations and not compromising the citizens' right to participate in the process. So we'll talk a little bit about governing and governing principles, uh, good governance principles, and uh, so whatever you want to make sure we cover today from open meetings, citizen participation, noticing meetings, meeting minutes, conducting the meeting, the role of the chair, all that good stuff we can cover. So think about what is it you want to know. We'll throw it up here on the board and that will be our agenda for today. And I think we're done by 6 this afternoon, is that right? Is that what you committed to? Oh, so I guess noon. So 
I have lots of stories, so I'll have to moderate my, my, all my yapping and stories because it's so much fun. Uh, so we can get out of here at noon. So uh, let me just quickly ask now the types of boards. So if you can just throw out the types of boards that you serve on so I can get a sense of my head who's in the room and what role you're playing. So library, library boards, oh. cemetery. cemetery boards, city. okay. City Board of Adjustments. Board of Adjustments with the city. Volunteer Fire Department. Ooh, volunteer fire. Uh, so it's on a uh, fire board? Mm -hmm. Okay. On the board. On the board. Elected position? Yep. Yep. All right. Which department? Huh? Which department? Green Up Potomac. Okay. Missoula Rural. <laughs> and same with you, fire board? Missoula Rural, yep. Okay. Great. Hospital district. Hospital district, elected position? Yep. Okay. Open lands. Open lands. Sewer and water. Sewer water district. HOA, planning board. So HOA, lovely, thank you for bringing that up. Anyone else in a, a so that is a neighborhood, right, homeowners association. So yeah, some of the stuff that we'll talk about may not apply legally for you. However, I always encourage you to do a lot of the things with, that public boards do because it's, a lot of what you do is very similar, although it's not a, a, a government board, it is like a quasi-government board, so yeah. Good. And anyone like from a church board or a, a nonprofit organization? Missoula Housing Authority. Housing Authority? Okay. And that's government? Yes. Uh, I believe it's not. A nonprofit? Okay. Anyone else? Community, yeah. Council. community councils. Oh, yeah. How many community councils do we have here represented? Just a few. Okay. Good. I'm on the election advisory committee for. Huh? I mean, Missoula County, excuse me. Okay, great. Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Board. Bicycle Pedestrian, okay, good. So we've got quite a diverse group of uh, boards being represented here, so that's great. Uh, all right, so I was going to do introductions, but wow, there's too many. We'll be here all day. So we're not going to do that. Just be nice to each other. <laughs> uh, so what we're going to do now, uh, if, if, uh, if you've been thinking about what is it you want to leave here today, we're going to be done at noon, what do I want to walk out of here making sure my questions are answered or I understand better what I'm supposed to be doing as a board member. So what would you like to make sure we cover today? Go. Um, I was at the very board meetings and when working with the public that attends it, I've seen where they allow comments, no questions, and they don't answer back any questions. And then others where they sit there and have interaction going back and forth. And I'm not really clear on what's appropriate and, and what's not. Yeah. Okay. So public comment. We'll talk about public comment and what, what would be appropriate during that time. Yeah. A lot of flexibility, but there's also some structure to it. So we can talk about that, that nuance. Yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to find out about the uh, discussions outside of public meetings, like what can and cannot be discussed. Yeah, it's called ex parte. Yeah, so and, and particularly depending on, uh, are you the Board of Adjustments or? Board of Adjustments and also a city council or a neighborhood council. Neighborhood council, okay. So, so for some of the boards in here, particularly planning board, Board of Adjustments, uh, you may be in a quasi-judicial role at certain times. Ex parte communication is going to be a big deal. So uh, let's put in here. Ex parte with an E? Yeah. All right. Now you'll notice communications. Uh, that's, I, I don't spell very well to begin with, and then on flip charts it's even worse, so bear with me. It's the way I express my creative juices that way. Over here, and then we'll go back. When the uh, communities have an agenda and they also take the minutes at the meeting, I want to be sure that you can read those minutes before they have been approved by this next meeting. Okay. Yep. Uh, TG meeting minutes. Uh, approval. When we get to that, PR, PPR approval. All right. When we get there, we'll. <laughs> all right. Over here. Yes. The ways that that should happen, and then also at the at what point um, can the agenda be changed or not no longer changed? Right. What, so uh, so we'll put a, a notice, and then uh, change. Can you also talk about how detailed those have to be? Now this is getting really sloppy. Yes, detail. Okay. 
detail of her agenda. Good. Yeah. Deliverables to the county and when are reports and the various reports that we need to deliver? Okay, reports. But also, what kinds of things are we supposed to deliver to the county? Yeah. Not just necessarily our reports, but what else? Yeah. Um, Liverables. Okay, so we'll, so some of that, the, the specifics as we drill down into the, the, the relationship and operations uh, between your board and the commission or the city council, I may not be able to talk specifically to that at, too far down. Uh, I'll stay higher level, but maybe there might be others here in the room that might be, or, or other staff members that might be able to help us. But my guess is there's probably something, and we'll talk about in general principles what that relationship, and then the specifics you'll probably need to, to get with a staff member. General, yeah. general principles it's is great. Good. Uh, any staff members here that work with the boards in the county? So a few of you. Okay, good. Taking notes furiously, thinking, oh, we've got to change this, or this guy's crazy. <laughs> he just committed us to do a whole lot of stuff I don't want to do. <laughs> yeah. Yes, ma'am. Differences between boards and advisory committees when you make the discussions, could you bring them up? Say that again. So um, I'm on the impact the advisory committee, so the differences between a board and an advisory committee as we work through these discussions, could you? Okay. So, so what I'm hearing then is the difference between what, what I'll call an administrative board mm -hmm. and an advisory board. So for these folks that were elected, hospital board, like the hospital district, fire districts, uh, conservation districts, mm -hmm. they'll be different than an advisory board, and we'll talk a little bit about that, yeah. So, advisory versus admin. Okay, and I'll try to, where appropriate, but we'll talk about those, yeah. Yes? Oh, so, say it again. Yeah. Mine. I spent 10 years on MSU staff center. So if there's distinctions between university governance practices and the community side, because I've got a lot of experience on the one side and I don't want it to flow inappropriately into. Right, right. Yeah, and there's been some things that the Supreme Court said on the university side, what they should and shouldn't do. Yeah, so we'll try to address that. I was just going to say, can you touch briefly on governance of the conduct of the board meeting? So like Robert's Rules of Order versus so meeting conduct, how that flows, we'll talk, we'll try to touch on that. And, and so hopefully each of you received a packet, a, uh, what is that, a folder? It's a folder with a bunch of handouts in it. And they're colored papers, and I'll be referring to different colored papers and different parts of that. But uh, So there is some information there on Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, we'll try to, to touch on those a little bit to give you a framework on how to, how to look at that and how to use that as a, as a tool. If you don't have a packet, we've got a bunch. So, yeah, they're up there with the, with the bagels. What else? Anything else quickly on the top of your head? That um, like the role of social media. Oh, dang. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, social media, love that one. Yeah, so we can talk about social media. I'm tweeting this meeting. Are you tweeting on it? <laughs> Live tweeting it, yes. Uh, can you touch on the roll of the chair? Roll the chair. Chair. Yeah. Um, what else is up there that I want to talk about that isn't up there? Huh? How about conflicts of interest? Okay. And then, oh, let's, uh, how about board liability? Yeah, that's conflict of interest. Yeah, okay. All right, board liability. All right, so since I write so big and we filled up one sheet already, we're almost. We've got one more hand up. Uh, can you touch on what can be, um, what you can do via email versus at the Yeah. 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 We'll just put electronic communication. Okay, good. That's a that's another good one. All right. To what extent should that be preserved? That record? Oh man, <laughs> records management. <laughs> yes. See, I wasn't joking when I said six o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> 
Records management. Yeah, all those things will get you, get you jammed up if we don't do them well. All right, that's a good start. Now, as you can tell, it's pretty informal, right? So as ideas, uh, questions come up, feel free. It's very interactive. Uh, it's a big room, lots of people don't feel at all uncomfortable about that. Uh, speak up and we'll make sure we try to cover all the material that you want to make sure you hear before we leave. So, there's not a flat surface up here that's very convenient. Let's start. First off, we're going to start out with the evaluation. Just fill it out now. Pass it up. <laughs> uh, that's this obnoxious green thing my staff says I need to do this. So fill it out at some point. Leave it on your chair and we'll collect them at the end. I'm not too concerned about it, but uh, it's there uh, uh, for me to collect at the end. Let's start on the right-hand side pocket. First sheet should say principles of good governance. So wh what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through a very, uh, like an inverted pyramid, okay? So it's going to be very broad, very general. And I'm, and I'm going to talk about kind of a governing philosophy and these principles of governance and good governance. And, I, and as you're approaching this position, this service that you're providing to your uh, community and your fellow citizens, I want you to be thinking about the difference between you as a public servant and a public official now in this capacity on a public board. That is different. It is different than your service maybe on a private nonprofit board or just working in business. Right? If, and, uh, you hear this a lot and I'm going to go out on a limb and say that if you want to run government like a business, you're going to go to jail. Okay. <laughs> So it's not the same, and if we run it like a business, we're going to compromise all sorts of principles of democracy. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about those principles of democracy. How do we, as, as appointed or elected members of our community, to serve and represent our fellow citizens? How do we, collectively we, facilitate good public policy, right? We are representing people, so we want to make sure that the people are engaged and are involved in that process of creating good public policy. So if we're not engaging them, we're not asking them, and they're not participating, how is it then that we're going to create good public policy that's going to impact their lives? So that's one of the things I want to make sure you're thinking about, that you're always thinking about how do we engage the people. It's more than just the discussion of the four other members of this board and I, and how are we going to solve the problem. It's not about you, it's about them. It's about the public. So I want you to start shifting that mindset out to how do we serve and how do I facilitate, provide that leadership for our community that we can take these complicated, challenging issues that we face and how do we make some sort of a policy or some sort of an outcome that we can all somewhat uh, abide by, okay? So these principles of good governance uh, are the same principles that our U.S. State Department uses as they travel around the world working with small or, well, other governments, trying to help them adopt principles of good governance. So let's just briefly go through this, and I say briefly, because I can never do this briefly, but I will try today. Uh, so we've got five different principles, uh, legitimacy and voice being one of them, that all people have legitimacy in your community. Top to bottom, in and out, left to right, everyone has legitimacy. They are here, they're members of the community, and they have a voice. Male, female, rich, poor, white, black, whatever color, they all are legitimate in, in the eyes of the government. You're treating everybody equitably and fairly as best you can. So participation, all men and women should have a voice in the discussing what's important to them and that the way you operate is consensus oriented. So what do you think I mean when I say consensus oriented? My way or the highway? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the opposite of that, but yes. <laughs> so. So it's, it's how do we work through an issue? I always get concerned when I hear, you know, because I get calls, we do a lot, the, the other part of what we do, the technical assistance side, we get lots of calls from people all over the state. Now I was concerned when I hear from a board or a commission or a council that it's a, it's a three to two vote, three to two, three to two. Why does that concern me, that they're consistently a three to two vote? They're not getting consensus. They're not working on the issue long enough to get the consensus. Right? It's a complicated, three-dimensional, challenging issue. And if you only get to the point where it's a tipping point where we've got, con we've got a majority enough to pass it, we're going to jam it down the minority's throat. I'd much rather prefer, particularly in our world, so I feel like 
Johnny Appleseed planting these seeds. We can do it in Montana. <laughs> we, can, we can work on these issues and try to find the best solution, not the easiest, quickest solution, right? So we want to be hearing those, that, those counter voices and how do we make sure that that is incorporated in the solutions we're trying to come up with. All right, so we're consensus oriented, we're going to work on it. For here's an example, uh, a, a large metro county uh, just threw out on the agenda a dog, a new dog leash ordinance. They wanted, this is a county, wanted to have all animals in the county and even public land on leashes. How well do you think that goes over? <laughs> right, so they just threw it out there and it, it really was placed on the, on the agenda by the, uh, a deputy city, uh, county attorney. He was chased to work by a dog, came in, he was upset, he wrote up this ordinance and he slapped it on the agenda without any sort of oversight. So now the commissioners are stuck there with a room full of angry dog owners because now you're doing what, you know, there was no work within the community, there's no discussion, no dialogue, it was just somebody that had uh, the access to the process that threw this somewhat inflammatory uh, ordinance on their agenda. What do you think it did for their trust between the county commission and the public? Took it right out. Yeah. <laughs> their trust took a nosedive, so now the public no longer trusts those folks because you're trying to pass a, a, a fast one on us, right? So there wasn't that, how do we work together? How do we solve this problem? If we have problems with dogs at large, then let's have a conversation about it, right? The thing we get challenged with a lot in government is that, well, you're going to create a committee. Well, yeah, we are. Why? To assess the situation. Yeah, we want, we want to figure out what's the problem, how are we going to bring people together, how do we get a committee of people that are going to represent everybody in the, that's at uh, a stake in this, and we're going to talk about it. We're going to try to come up with a solution. This is not, okay, I think this is what the solution is, and I've got the position where I can jam it through your throat. Right? That's not our style. Boy, I'm getting all wound up here, aren't I? <laughs> okay. I should stop reading the news feeds in my... <laughs> so anyway. You get my point, right? We want to bring people together. We want to find consensus around these issues. Direction, strategic vision. We want to have some sort of direction and vision. Where's our board headed? What are we trying to accomplish? What, what's important to us? What's important to the people that we serve relative to the area in which we're uh, providing guidance, right? If, if we're a planning board, you're going to be working extensively with the community to try to figure out what's important. What are our values? How do we reflect our community's values and interests over the next 20 years in a growth policy? Right? Our subdivision regulations. How are they going to look so that we have a community that we all feel like we can be proud of? And that takes a lot of engagement. You've got to have that vision so that then the, the, the decisions you're making are going to be geared towards and support that particular vision. If you do not have a vision or some sort of a strategic uh, plan, then any decision will work. Right? You can be easily influenced by the public or the last person that talks to you and you're just kind of a feather in the wind. So it's much better to engage the community, have this conversation, where do we want to go, and then we will be responsible for helping marshal the resources to get us there. I think too often they skimp on the second part of that. Yes. The understanding of the historical, cultural, with all the complexities involved. I've seen way too many strategic visions that act like the past doesn't exist yep. and just have this, look what we're going to do. Yeah. It's, and the important part of, of doing this process of strategic planning, strategic visioning, is that everything's in the context of the past. To, to expect an organization to be going at this trajectory and then suddenly, whoop, up to here is unreasonable, right? So you've got to make sure that you're doing that in the context of your past so it's a nice, smooth line into, into your future. Um, and I had another thought and I just forgot it, but that's probably to your advantage. All right, next, being responsive and effective and uh, efficient around that performance idea. So that you are acting, that's one of the things about being on a board that we want to make sure that you're not kicking the can down the road that you're taking those challenging issues and you say, you know what, we're going to address it. When I became the mayor of the city of Shoto, they had not done anything with the city water or sewer systems for 70 years. We were losing 10 million gallons a month of water leaking out of the delivery system. Four million gallons was going through water meters. 10 million gallons was going out, leaking out of the system, right? Administration after administration just kept kicking the can down the road and saying it's not something I want to deal with because I've got to raise rates. Don't want to be the bad guy to raise rates. So when I took office, we had flat rate, $15 a month, no matter how much you used. <laughs> so guess who was the bad guy? When I came into office, I realized, holy moly, there's a lot of cans sitting around my feet. And we just started picking up those cans, 
right, took us, now as I, I keep in touch with what's going on in, in that community, it's now 15 years, uh, 10 years later. And they've now renovated their water system and their sewer system. It took uh, 14 years of planning and financing and getting grants for them to finally get to the point where they've, they've retrofitted and fixed that system, right? It would have been easy just to kick that can down the road another four years, but the problem doesn't go away, right? So a lot of the things that you're going to be facing, the problem's not going to go away, so provide that leadership in the community say, look, we're going to be responsive, we're going to take that issue, we're going to deal with it. And we're going to be as effective and efficient as possible. Now there's certain things about what we're going to learn here later that there's nothing efficient about this. Noticing meetings, making sure the public's there, that's not efficient. If you want to make decisions, you just go and make a decision, right? That's efficiency. So we want to make sure we're as efficient as possible within the framework of the law and the Constitution. Once we understand what the law and Constitution says, then we can start figuring out how do we be as effective and as efficient within those fr that framework. Like I said, if you, if you try to, to uh, over, uh, operate outside of those bounds, bad things happen. Uh, accountability, being accountable and transparent. Uh, I had a, a great question not a, while, a while back. Someone asked me, can we vote by secret ballot? So what do you think? So why not? I'm hearing no. So why, why what, what, what kind of, hopefully it's making the hair on the back of your neck stand up saying, oh, that doesn't sound right. Because deliberation and decisions have to be made. Right. And, and that leads to accountability, right? So we need to be open. We need to be transparent. The discussions that we have. So these are one of those principles that we have that the law also uh, validates, right? So if we're being open and transparent, the discussions we're having are open and, and engaging to the public. And the decision we're making, I can be held accountable for that. Right? And I have to give my rationale. These are the reasons why I chose to do this. And all these possibilities that we have before us, we have to make a decision. And this is what I'm choosing. And these are the reasons why. And it's much better and easier for you to explain these are the reasons why. And I recognize the shortcomings that we're going to sacrifice something over here, but I think that these things we'll gain are much better. That articulation to the public may help them understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. They may not necessarily agree with it, but they'll understand it. And that will help build trust within your, between you and the, the public you serve. If you're trying to do things behind closed doors, the back, the back room, people can't see what's going on, what is their first inclination going to be? Yeah, corruption, you know, you're not, I'm, I'm not involved, I have a right to be involved, uh, and now everything that you do will be in question. So I often say that the uh, trust, as you increase the level of trust between you and the public you serve, you're going to reduce the transaction cost of, of doing business. Does that make sense? The higher the level of trust there is, the lower the transaction cost. So if you had a low level of trust between your board and the public, what would your meetings look like? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not very friendly, right? You got a whole lot of people there and they're pushing back on everything that you're, you're doing. They're asking questions more than they are commenting. They question everything that you're doing. And it just slows the whole process down because there's a low level of trust. So that, if there's not anything you can remember when you leave here today, is how do I, how do you collectively build trust within your board and the way you operate and the how you engage the public? You want to have that high level of trust. Right, allow you to do much more in your organization. All right, and then finally, fairness, equity, and rule of law. That we have rules, we have laws that we follow, we treat everybody the same. Uh, there's an equality here that, uh, well, there's equality and fairness, and those are an interesting balance. Uh, I won't go into that, but here's a quick story, too. We had uh, a city that was struggling. The mayor and the council were fighting. Go figure. Executive branch, legislative branches, they weren't getting along at all. The mayor would come in to open the meeting, or the city council meeting. They'd all stand up, do the Pledge of Allegiance. They'd sit down, and immediately someone from the council would say, I move to adjourn. Get a second. They'd all stand up and walk out. They didn't pay the claims, they didn't pay payroll, they didn't do anything on the agenda. The council just got up and walked out. So the mayor says, well, gosh, that's not good. We need to, uh, and it was all over the appointment. Here's this, all over the appointment of a city attorney. They had no city attorney. Mayor had, who, this is who I want to appoint. Council says, we don't want that person. We want someone else. And there is the loggerhead. So for the next four months, 
move to adjourn, they get up and walk out. Move to every meeting that they had called, special meetings, they weren't paying bills, they weren't signing claims, they weren't doing anything. And uh, finally, uh, the community had to rally up and send out a petition and recall three of the council members and the mayor. So that's what it took. Think about the amount of energy it takes within a community to sign a petition, to go through the process, to put something on the ballot, <coughs> to get rid of these boneheads. Ugh. Anyway, we're at a meeting. So we, we went up there several times to try to help them understand this is your responsibility, this is your duty as an elected official. This is what you're supposed to be doing. And we'd show them in the law, this is what it says, and here's the, here's the kicker, what they'd said is, oh, we don't agree with that. <laughs> And again, mind you, they had no city attorney either. So they, they, so back to that last principle of the rule of law. This whole thing depends on people following through on what the law says. And it breaks down spectacularly when people decide to be bad actors. There's a community I'm working with right now that the council has approved a budget and the mayor's not following it. And they say, well, what can we do? I said, well, where's my little thing? Let me ask you folks. This again, just these principles of governance here, how things operate and work together. What do these th three circles represent when we talk about government? So we got legislative branch, executive branch, and judicial. So right now, if we have a problem between these two branches, where do you go? You've got to go down to the judicial. So what the, the city council needs to do then is they need to sue the mayor, go to court, district court, and ask the judge to insists that he follows the law, follows the budget. So, if we don't play by the rules, we don't follow the rule of law, it becomes very, very cumbersome very quickly. There's no local government cop out there that will come in and cite you for not complying with the law. You've got to go to the court and you've got to uh, plead your case there. So what happens typically is things, this usually doesn't happen. They just fight back and forth without going to them because it's just too much work. Too much cost, too much expense. <coughs> so, uh, principles of good governance. Think about those. Think about when you engage with your board, how do we operate with these principles? How do we make sure people are engaged, people are participating, we're transparent, we're open, that we're responsive to things that are happening, we're not kicking the can down the road, and that we're following the law, right? We're acting as good actors as we represent the people in our community. All right. Any questions about those principles of good governance? Yes, sir. Yeah, in regards to the last one, the rule of law, particularly laws on human rights, um, if you, and again, you're, as the board, you're, you're bringing in or trying to uh, connect with the, the values, the uh, feelings of your community, what if those values and objectives of the community go against the law? Yeah, and that's, oh, too quick to t tear this off. We see that quite a lot, right? If you look at the national stage, and this is what's so fascinating, uh, and this is what really gets me excited about seeing government work, the, 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 the democratic principles, small d democratic principles by which we operate, and these checks and balances. Uh, so if we have an electorate out there that really has strong feelings about a certain issue, right, and they want to move that issue forward and canonize that in some sort of a law. They can put pressure on their elected officials, the legislature, to create that law, right? But if, if the executive branch doesn't necessarily like that law, they can veto it. But if the, they're also elected, so they're going to say, no, no, we're, I don't want to <laughs> stop this momentum of our community, and so they might sign that into law, right? But then we have the watchdog down here, the judicial branch, to then watch that. And so this is what we're seeing play out. And we saw this oh, over the last 20 years with uh, DOMA and uh, the uh, gay marriage. It's happening right now with transgender bathroom issues, right? So what we're seeing is these, this legislation taking place and how this part of the government, and then we'll find out eventually it'll all work itself th through the courts. We're not talking so much about gay marriage anymore compared to what we were five years ago. Why? It's settled. It's no longer this public debate. So if you really just stand back and look at this as an exercise of democracy, of this discussion, this heated part, this debate back and forth, as we're trying to figure out how do we represent our values, how do we take these constitutional values and rights that we have, and how do we translate them into action today. And so it's been fascinating to watch this, this play out 
in a, in a more of an academic, you know, just stepping back. So as interesting as last year, I was in uh, North Carolina working with some county commissioners there. And this is their big bathroom bill, right, North Carolina? And it was whatever's back in the news again, they're trying to do some other bill. And, and I made mention of this, how this all plays out. And the press was in the back of the room. And they <laughs> drug me out and they wanted to interview me on the news. And I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done? <laughs> I've just inserted myself into this big debate. But, I, but my whole point was, it's, it's interesting to watch how this plays out. People get really uh, close in right, uh, in this close combat about these strong feelings and emotions, right, because they're reading all this stuff here on social media, right, they get all wound up, but really I like to just step back a little bit, get in your little drone and get up above the fray and say, wow, this is really fascinating to watch how this plays out, how it all works, right, eventually it'll be settled one way or the other, it'll eventually get settled. If we can't get it figured out here sufficiently, then we'll get it settled through the court system. And that's what's happening in North Carolina, it's what's happening right now at the I guess there's a petition going on right now in Montana for our, our bath. I just saw it in the paper today, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's a, it's, it's playing out right here. So we'll, we'll be able to watch democracy happen right here in Montana around these issues. And, and how we as Montanans feel relative to our Constitution, whether that's going to work for us or not. And probably, it'll probably end up with the Supreme Court. Marcy's Law is the same thing. We're going through that same process. Energetic citizens engage the process, put something on the ballot, we all vote on it, and then we've got to make sure that it's consistent with the rest of the Constitution. And that's right now in the hands of the, of the Supreme Court for Mercy's Law. So it's really fascinating to watch this work. Right? You may have strong opinions about it one way or the other, but if you just back up a little bit and say, wow, this is kind of fun. I think it's fun. I'm kind of a wonk though. All right. So any other questions? Did that help? Yeah, and again, like I said, this is, this is right what the State Department uses. So they're, they're going to these other countries trying to help make sure that you're, you're honoring the human rights. They might not have a very strong constitution that defines those rights, right? So they've got to look to other sources, this, to, to the, the UN and some of these other places, say these are uh, rights that we all should have as, as humans on this planet, and then try to make sure you apl up, apply those to your citizens. Uh, all right, so what thing can we, uh, let's do... Board liability real quick, because that'll be an easy one. All right. Board liability. You're all screwed. <laughs> so, no, you're not. As long as you are operating within the framework of your board, within the course and scope of your board appointment, you will be indemnified and that the city or the city or county will defend you okay so here's the important part are you operating within the course and scope of your appointment that's the challenge so what I would suggest you doing you do is connect with whichever entity has appointed you if it's a city or county and ask them for the enabling legislation that created or formed your board Does that make sense I need to see or we need to see the resolution the official act by the, the, uh, by the governing body that created your board. And in that, it should define what your course and scope is, what it is that you're responsible for doing, if you're advisory or not. Or if you're a fire district board, you've got, within the law, it defines the framework by which you operate. So that here's the deal. If you operate outside of that framework, then you'll be held personally liable. If you're operating within the framework, then the city or the county will defend you because you're just doing your job. Does that make sense? So that's why I say it's really important for you to find out what, what is that box that we need to stay in. And if you ever have question, seek competent legal counsel. If you feel like we don't know uh, whether we should be making this decision or not, seek legal counsel, city attorney, county attorney, or you may have to get your own counsel if, if you're an autonomous board. Uh, but seek that competent legal counsel to say, look, can we make this decision? Biggest problem is going to be around if how many of you here your boards have employees that work for you? Library, cemetery, maybe cemetery, cemetery as well. Library does. Fire district might have. I think they work for us. They work for the district. <laughs> yes, so they're going to work for the district, right. but you are the governing body for the district. Right. So, so I, now I bring that up. If you have employees, then then there could be employment law that you need to make sure that you're covering. Uh, and that you're following the law relative to employment practice uh, because if, if you don't follow the law, 
that could come back and splash back on you. So just make sure you understand that framework. So one, one way to do that is ask, can we see the enabling legislation or that, that resolution creating our board? If they don't have it, and they, so this is where the staff always say, oh, you dirty rotten. <laughs> uh, they may not be able to find it. That's all right. Uh, doesn't mean it wasn't there, it's just they can't find it. So what we suggest you do is sit down with the commissioners or the, the city council and, and create a new uh, resolution that defines that role and, and scope for you. Does that make sense? So that's, so uh, it, th it's a quick story because I always have them. They're not always quick. Watch the time. No, a question. question? Okay. A comment? So no. we're seated like sewer board but we're governed by Ms. <coughs> And we're not incorporated? Right, the, it's not incorporated, but you have a sewer district. Sewer district and a separate water district. And you're elected as a sewer and district? Yes. Yeah, so the, the county has limited oversight on you. You are somewhat autonomous. You make your own decisions. You're elected. You're accountable to the people within your district. Right. Yeah, and then there's laws that define what your course and scope are as a water or sewer district that says this is what you can and cannot do within the code, and then you've got to make sure you follow those. Yeah. So, oh, st the story, uh, the, for role and scope. So here's a quick example. There was a mayor in a small town, uh, had some dogs running around, and uh, usually he would just gather them up and take them to the owner, the dog owner, and you know, put them in the backyard, take a picture of the dog, and then put a, the Polaroid with a little ticket saying you owe 25 bucks for your dog at large, and he'd put it in their mailbox. And people would pay it. And they went on, this is like, for years they were doing this, and every mayor that was elected, that was kind of their role, to run around collecting dogs. Well, there was two dogs that were running around that were big, beefy, ugly looking dogs, and they were uh, barking at kids at the school. No one knew who these dogs belonged to. All right, so he gathered them up, took them out in the forest. Ta -da! They, they went to the ranch in the sky. Um, the next day, the owners of those dogs, newly moved into town, said, hey, we understand you've collected up our dogs. We were here to get them back and pay whatever fine we have to pay. We were apologized they got out, new yard, trying to fix the holes. He's like, oh, <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, so what happened is the, the, these citizens, these, this family sued. Uh, and come to find out, the mayor said, hey, I'm golden, because in the law it says that the, one of the powers powers of the city is to deal with nuisance animals, right? So the city had the power to deal with this. However, the city never adopted an at-large animal ordinance. They never, uh, uh, yeah, they didn't define the nuisance. They didn't cr uh, provide any due process for the dogs or the owners. This just, this, the mayor thought, well, I'm, we have the power to do this, I'm doing it. So come to find out the mayor was operating outside the course and scope of his responsibilities. There's nowhere in the duties of the mayor that says you are the official dog catcher, right? So had they adopted an ordinance that in uh, absent of an animal control officer, the mayor will act in that place, you know, giving the mayor the authority to do that, and that there would define what is an at-large animal, what is the due process, how do we go about, you know, the waiting period, all that, none of that existed. So at the end of the day, the mayor ended up having to uh, defend himself personally. It cost him about 15 grand between his legal fees, the other family's legal fees, and then the fees that he had to pay, the, the loss of whatever, whatever with the family. So that's kind of what it looks like, right? He thought he was covered. He really wasn't. And so it really is a wake-up call for that community to realize that they need to formalize a little bit more clearly, this is what we're supposed to do, this is the law, you know, like what they should have done to begin with. All right. Good? Yeah. Question about, could you just describe um, the appeals, kind of how an appeal of a board decision works that goes to court and what's expected of board members and staff? Yeah, so if you're making decisions, uh, so if you have, depending on the type of board, if you, if you have decision making authority or power, um, Typically, it's going to be governed by your policies. You've got to create policies that define this whole process. Uh, that if there's an action taken, there's got to be an appeal. There doesn't have, there's usually an appeal process, right? So if, so if you have a staff member that, say, at the library, somebody's creating problems at the library, and the librarian kicks them out, right? 
Well, that based on a policy, right? You act inappropriate in the, in the library. We have uh, an expectation of safety and blah, 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 and, and quietness or whatever in the library. You're violating that based on the librarian's judgment. We're going to remove you from the, the, the place. Now, due process says, well, I want to argue my case. They can come and appeal to the board. There is suspension from the library. You with me so far? Is that where we're going? I'm thinking more of, of an appeal of the board decision. Oh, okay. Our, our, I, I staff the board of adjustment and appeals of those decisions go to district court, but it's kind of never been explained what what the district court does. What, what's involved? What, what the responsibility of of the board? Yeah, so in that case, okay, so that case, you want to be very clear as a board when you're denying a, a request for a variance as your rationale why. And try as best you can to connect that back to the, the zoning ordinances or whatever you might have that you're comparing. This is what the expectation is for this neighborhood. This is what you're proposing to do. And this is why we feel that this would be an inappropriate activity. And, and that's your rationale. So that when the judge looks at that, they can say, what's the rationale behind it? Are you being arbitrary? We just don't like you because you wore a purple shirt, and so we're denying your request. That yeah. has nothing to do with the, the rationale of, of the proposal. So, so then you just let the process play itself out in the court. And, then, and so if you do your job well and articulate well the reasons why and the rationale, then the judge can say whether that's valid or not. I don't know that helps, but that's usually how the process works. So really, then you then let the county attorney deal with it. If you do your job well at that end, because you can't come back and say, well, let's fix it. <laughs> you already had your chance. Now the judge will look at it and decide whether that was appropriate or not. Have we scared you all yet? <laughs> kind of. All right. All right. Well, let's, let's see if we can do more of that scaring. Ah. Let's jump into something exciting. Let's talk about open meetings. And already it's an hour in. Dang. Open meetings. So what, is that a color? Kind of gray. Is, it, is it gray or is it white? Well, this is white. white. Yeah. So that's, gray. that's white. It says gray. Is this the one I want to? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. and I, th uh, I think I pulled it from the left hand, so left -hand pocket. <laughs> Bluish? Gray? Purple? Purple? Maybe we'll go with purple so it's on the left hand pocket. It says at the top, Montana statutes for right to know and right to participate. <laughs> it might be purple. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So here's, this is one of the most exciting parts of this whole, ah, I get so excited. All right, so here's something to, for you to consider. Uh, let's do this. I can do. So in 1972, what was the most exciting thing that happened in the state of Montana? The All right, so we adopted a, the Constitution, right? Now in that Constitution, it defines our rights, our privileges, the responsibilities and roles of government, uh, and what our relationship is, you know, so it's a, and, and what are our values, right? What's important to us as the state of Montana? And then how do we reflect that in the, in the, the, the relationship that we have as Montanans with our government? Right, ensuring that these values are protected and that uh, all that good stuff. Right, so that's that great constitution. Once the constitution is uh, ratified by the public, then where does it go? What's the next step in its journey? Who gets it next after the, uh, it's ratified by the public? So it goes, where's another color? It, <laughs> we, we put it in the town square. The next place it goes is the legislature. State yes. U-R-E right here at Montana State Legislature. Now what they do is they take this document, the Constitution, they say, okay, now how do we operationalize this? Because right now it's kind of lofty ideas and these, these rights that we have. But now how do we make sure that we know uh, and, and make sure that those rights are protected and, and are canonized within the operation of government? Right? So when it says you have a right to know, well, what does that look like? How do we, what is the framework for that? Okay, so the legislature then gets it and they create the Montana Code Annotated, the MCA, right? And that's basically the law that governs uh, the state. And then from there, it, we'll kick it down on the local level. We then create local policies. Now, the MCA, thank goodness, the legislature has been very broad in general. They give local governments broad powers, right? 
They don't drill it down to the very nitty gritty, you shall do this, 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 this. But they just say, look, you gotta make sure these things happen. However you make sure it happens within this framework is up to you, right? That's great. But we need to create these policies. This is where that mayor I was talking about earlier lacked in having these local policies and laws. They just took this general powers that the state legislature gave them and were operating kind of like Wild West without local policies and ordinances to, to, to provide the specificity of what does it look like when we, uh, when we uh, exercise the power for dealing with at-large animals. All right, so we have these local policies that provide guidance. Uh, and then huh, what's great is the Constitution and the legislature, and even in these policies, we have ambiguous words. We have words that uh, like reasonable. reasonable, thank you. Reasonable, you have a reasonable duty. Well, what does reasonable mean, right? What might be reasonable to me may not be reasonable to you. So how do we, who do we go to? Who do we ask to give us clarity on what is reasonable when, when we use these ambiguous words? What's that? The commissioner. Oh, yeah. But the judicial branch. So, so once the first stop we go to is when we, we have these words that we don't really know what it means, but it's an important word. Uh, because no one wants to, to lock it in up here, we'll go to the Montana Attorney General. We'll ask the Attorney General, say, could you give us an opinion as to what this law means? When it says this word, reasonable uh, opportunity to participate, what does that mean? Right? Or reasonable amount of time for notice. What, what, what's reasonable? Because two weeks might be reasonable for one person where four hours might be reasonable for someone else. So the Attorney General will give an opinion, and, and that opinion stands as law until one of two things happen. One, the legislature defines the law more clearly in the law, right? They clarify the law. Or two, what's the other thing that might happen? Court. Supreme Court. Supreme Court makes a, a judgment and that then would overrule the Attorney General's opinion. And the other one is sue, right? You can sue the city or county to get clarification. So not all, now Missoula and Missoula County has had their fair share <laughs> of lawsuits. And, don't feel, again, it's, it's one of those things, we're all wound up at the time, we're all passionate about it, but just step back a little bit. This is the only way by which we can gain clarity with the law outside of having the legislature bring more clarity to it. So when, it's, when there's ambiguity in the law, you go to the court and you say, you ask the court, help us understand the law. The city or the state or the, or the county has said, this is how we interpret the law, but it's ambiguous. And the citizen says, I don't, I don't think that that's an appropriate interpretation. I think it should be this way. And let the court decide. So that's how the system is designed. So, uh, so just keep that in mind that not all lawsuits are bad. Uh, so Montana Supreme Court. Right? So think about this as this narrowing of the Constitution over time. Now, we're about 45, 50, what is it, 72 to whatever, was it 45 years? I'm not good with math. That's why I do what I do, I don't do math. It's been a long time that all the questions that we have about what it means in the Constitution, the rights that we have as citizens have pretty much been clarified over the last 45 years. So if you're getting sued because of an open meetings or a citizen participation issue, it's because you screwed up. <laughs> it's not because you didn't know or it's ambiguous, it's because you screwed up. Uh, so if we look at this, let, let's do this now. Top of the page, we've got three constitutional rights. Uh, so this is the Montana Co Constitution, Article 2, Declaration of Rights. First one, uh, Section 8, right to participate. The public has the right to expect governmental agencies to afford such reasonable opportunity for citizen participation in the operation of the agencies prior to final decision as may be provided by law. Right? As may be provided by law. So the Constitution says, look, we need to be more clear about this in the law but there's this fundamental right that we have as citizens, that we have the right to participate prior to, what does it say? Afford such reasonable opportunity for citizen participation in operation agencies prior to final decision. Prior to final decision is the key thing. Okay, so very general here, a single sentence, right? The legislature gets it and they turn that into about two pages of law that helps us understand that single sentence. To make sure we know as citizens what am I to expect from the government and what is the government expected to do on behalf of us, right? So there's more clarity, that's a good thing. 
And then we get down to local policies where you guys are probably adopting your own rules for your board. This is how we notice our meetings. This is how we develop the agenda to make sure that we are not violating the citizens' right to participate prior to final action. That is a constitutional fundamental right that citizens have. We want to make sure that we are operating such that we're not violating that right that they have. Because if we do, oh my, ah, I need like a third flip chart up here. We'll put that over here. We may need to refer to it later. If we violate the Constitution, how much do you think uh, what it costs uh, a local government, what do you think it costs to violate someone's constitutional right? What's the going rate right now? Anybody know? <laughs> tell, me, tell me when. <laughs> tell me when. Yes. Good. That went good there. Uh, no. That's what it's cost, uh, for those of you that can't see. It's half a million dollars. So $500,000 is what it costs the city of Great Falls when they violated uh, a citizen's constitutional right to participate prior to final action. And I'll tell that story in a little bit. But so that's the going rate now. Inflation, who knows? This is about six years ago. Mm. So this could be a retirement plan for some of you. <laughs> just, just saying. All right. Uh, all right, second, uh, second right there is section nine. The right to know. No person shall be deprived of the right to examine documents. We had that as part of our questions, right? On uh, retention, electronic communication, how do we retain that stuff? Uh, records management. All right. So to examine documents or to observe the deliberations of all public bodies or agencies of the state government and its subdivisions. Guess what? You folks fall under that category of a subdivision of government, of state government. Except in the case in which the demand of individual privacy clearly exceeds the, public's, uh, the merits of public disclosure. So the citizens have a right to know and observe what's going on. However, there's this other right, this other right of individuals. So let's read the next one. The right of privacy. The right of individual privacy is essential to the well-being of a free society and shall not be infringed without showing of a compelling state interest. So this is one of those very fascinating things that you guys get an opportunity to balance. On occasion, those of you that have employees, for example, you may have to balance out these two constitutional rights. One side, you have the public's right to know what's going on and to observe your deliberations and to comment prior to final action. And the other hand, you have an individual's right to privacy, that there may be things that you're doing as a public agency that is going to be dealing with someone's issues of privacy. Right? So if you are to uh, adhere to one right, the right of the public to know, you may be violating someone's privacy right. And if you are always over here saying, oh, there's a right to privacy, when there's really not a legal right to privacy, you may be violating the public's right to know. So you have, are stuck in that balancing act trying to decide, is there a compelling state interest to know what's going on here with this person and, and an issue that may be of private nature or not? Right? So fortunately, we've got some guidance as we've narrowed this down, so the Supreme Court's helped us with some of that as we go through that balancing test. In any time you're dealing with an issue and you think, oh my, should we be closing this meeting? I would say seek competent legal counsel. Make sure you've got a, an attorney there to help you navigate those waters because if you screw up, you're going to court. And if you screw up with the attorney there, then he's going to have to defend you and give the rationale, his legal argument as to why he chose to do one way or the other. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, this is a semi-specific thing, but you're, you're talking about three to, three to two decisions and such and reaching consensus. Um, so let's say you're, you know, you're having a meeting, you have discussions on one side, rationales, discussions on the other side, and you come to a board or whatever, or you table it till the next meeting. So then let's say two of the people on the board, and you know, Joe says to Cindy, you know, let me explain a little bit to you my rationale of why I'm thinking this way with the idea of maybe kind of having her expanding her thinking and bringing her over to his side. Is that something they can, he can do legally in terms of, you know, let's just sit down, let me kind of explain myself instead of taking up a whole bunch of uh, meeting time? Yeah, time? yeah. So, do you understand the, so if I understand the question correctly is, is outside of a meeting, yeah. can you connect with another board member to try to interact and, and, and to understand their position and try to explain your position better. It's, so that's, that's the politicking part of this. Yeah, so that would be appropriate. If you have a five-member board or a four-member, well, five-member board, most of you? 
So if you've got a five-member board, two of you are getting together, is that going to be a problem? No. If three of you get together, is that a problem? No. That's a problem, right? So, so, so yes, that's part of the process, right? Uh, and we'll, we'll drill into that a little bit more about that relationship between the quorum in, in just a minute. But yeah, that's a good question. Yes, ma'am. The question regarding the what you're talking about as far as the right to privacy, is there, I, I mean, and you said refer to your attorney, but is there a, just a general rule? Does the person, does the individual that the, if the privacy issue is around have to request a meeting be closed? I mean, like, oh, we're going to get to that. Okay. Oh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of statutes on that that we'll, we'll, we'll get to that if I can stretch. Yeah. But yeah. I just keep talking too much. All right. So, yes, we'll get to that, and th there's some framework, and then I'll explain some other things that, that the Supreme Court has said that might help with that. So you see, we've got a right, we have these certain rights. The legislature now has gone through and defined for us in four pages of, of text how to operationalize uh, those three rights. Now, if you add your policies in your, in your package, you've got a policy uh, on the right hand, left hand pocket, if I recall. Nope, right hand pocket. It has a little box at the top, looks like this. It says, rules and procedures for governing water sewer districts. Huh? There we go. So this is a boilerplate that we've developed. Because in the law, it says, basically, thou shalt create policies. Well, let's just read it. Uh, first page of the purple sheet. I'm jumping all over and getting you all confused, but that's okay. Hang with me here. 23103, public participation, governor to ensure guidelines adopted. This is what it says. Each agency, okay, now look up here under definitions, highlighted there. Agency means any board, bureau, commission, department, authority, or officer of the state or local government authorized by law to make rules, determine contested cases, or entering contracts, etc. So basically, all of you, if you've been appointed by a public agency to perform a public duty, you are a board that fits under the definition of an agency. So that rationale or justification, each agency, so all of you, shall develop procedures for permitting and, what's that next word? Encouraging. Ooh, encouraging. That's not a passive word, is it? No, that's an active word. So not just permitting and we're done, but encouraging. So there is an expectation that you encourage participation in the decisions and the process that you go through. All right. So shall develop procedures for permitting and encouraging the public to participate in the agency's decisions that are of significant interest to the public. Who wants to define that one for us? <laughs> right? So that's another ambiguous term, significant interest of the public. So that's a tough one. The way I see it is any decision you make is going to be of significant interest. And that's where Great Falls messed up and why they ended up paying half a million dollars. And I'll get to that story in just a second because there's something else I want. Oh, back to here. I don't want to leave you hanging on this one. So these boilerplate rules of procedure are, are generic on our website. Now, if you turn your folder over, you can see our website. It's like something like msulocalgov.org or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on our website, you can go under a, the, one of the tabs. It says resources, and it has all these handouts in your packet are on our website as PDFs, except this one. This one is a Word document that you can download this on your computer and you can use this as a boilerplate to create your rules of procedure for your board. So it covers when do we meet, where do we meet, what times do we meet, where do we notice our, our meeting agenda, uh, how do we deal with meeting minutes, uh, who is in charge of creating the agenda. All that stuff can be found in here and you can customize it. You can put your own uh, things in here as long as they're consistent with the law. Before you adopt this as a board, I would encourage you strongly to have this reviewed by legal counsel to ensure that whatever you've done in here is consistent with the law so you don't end up getting messed up there. All right? Yes, sir. How, how are these policies different than the bylaws for a board? So, same thing. So, I'll use policies and procedures interchangeable with bylaws. Okay. Yeah, the bylaws are pretty much your governing document, and that's what this would be considered a governing document. Yeah. Yep, so if you already have policies or, or, or bylaws, I would review those bylaws and just compare them with this just to make sure there's, because there may be things in here like, ooh, we never thought of that, right? So let's, let's see if we want to incorporate that in. And there may be things that you do, right? The way you operate that makes you function and flow and, and operate really effectively and efficiently, that is consistent with the law, 
right, all those qualifiers. It's consistent with the law, you're effective, efficient. I would write it down and say this process is going to be canonized in our rules, and, uh, rules of procedure because you're just one election or one appointment away from disaster, right? You get some of the cycles off and now you've got a new person that comes on the board and the dynamics have changed. And what may have worked really well before is now blown up. And unless you write it down, those good operating processes and procedures, you write them down, then, then my hope is that this document will transcend any individual on the board. That this is how the board operates regardless of who sits in those seats. That's what we want to see in the state of Montana is consistency and reliability in the way we operate in government. That we're not being, as citizens, whipsawed by every new election, a new person, we don't know where we're going, but no, those people occupy those seats operating this way to make decisions on your behalf and that's, that's reliable and that's what we're looking for. All right, so uh, rules of procedure, let me just finish off that section there. I really should put my glasses on because if I hadn't read this like 5,000 times. Uh, next sentence says, where the, the procedures must ensure adequate notice. See, again, another ambiguous term, adequate notice. You know, so we've got to figure that out and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, adequate notice and assist the public participation before final agency action is taken on a significant, uh, on, taken, no, uh, the action is taken. That is of significant interest to the public. The agenda of a meeting as defined in 23202 must include an item allowing public comment on any public matter that is not on the agenda of the meeting and is within the jurisdiction of the agency conducting the meeting. Right? So you need to have public comment and it, you also need to allow public comment on any matter that's not on the agenda. It's implied that you're going to allow public comment on the agenda items. You also need to allow comment on agenda uh, on the agenda of anything that's not on the agenda. Pfft, mess that up, we'll talk about it. However, the agency may not take action on any matter discussed unless specific notice of that matter is included on the agenda and public comment has been allowed on that matter. You with me on that? So, someone comes to your meeting to make public comment. You're the Parks and Rec Board and they say, hey, those lights at the softball field are shining into my, my house. My little four-year-old's bedroom is lit up like it's noonday at 11 o'clock at night. Can you shut those lights off at 8 o'clock so my kid can get to sleep? It's a nightmare with that kid running around, bouncing off the walls. It's like daylight in there. And the commission of the little board says, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. I don't know why we got them on so late. I move that we shut the lights off at 8 o'clock. What just happened? Yeah, you just made a final action on a decision that was not on the, on the meeting agenda, uh, and you did not allow public comment of that, right? So what should you do is you should say, thank you for your comment. As a board member, you say, I move that we get a group of people that use this resource, right? So the softball group, the baseball guys, the soccer folks, whatever, get all those stakeholders together and some local neighborhood folks and let's have a discussion about how we're going to manage the lights in, on the field, right? That would be the way that you would go about the process to decide should we or shouldn't we. But you don't make the decision right there without public comment and without the public being noticed. Because if you did, then at 8 o'clock when those lights go off, who do you think is going to be mad? The softball folks out there that play till 11 o'clock at night. The lights go off, so what the heck? So you can make the motion on a separate topic that isn't listed on the agenda as long as it's not a final act? Yes, good question. Good nuanced question because now making that action, take, like making that motion, the final act will be taking place some other time down the, the line. So this is an administrative act, right? So this is one of the things that they talk about in the, in the law, or the, I think it's the uh, uh, Supreme Court Attorney General, they talk about administrative acts wouldn't need to be noticed, right? So if, if at a meeting you say, gosh, we need to talk about this more, I move that we have a meeting next Tuesday, you know, and with the only meet monthly, right? We're going to have a special meeting. You can make that motion because the, They'll, they'll take, that yeah, that they can return and report that we can take action on later. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's a nuanced thing, but you, uh, you got to make sure that you're not taking final action on something, but allowing, uh, without allowing the public to comment. All right, we'll come, uh, now I've been, I've been pushing things off a couple times. What was one of the things I pushed off here? Oh, let's talk about Great Falls real quick. Great Falls, bless their hearts. They, uh, 
their policy. So we said here, the, the Constitution says that you should be able to uh, comment prior to final action. The legislature says you need to com allow the public to comment prior to final action. There are policies at Great Falls said that we will allow the public to comment prior to final action. What they did is they had their, for whatever reason, their agenda had the opening whatever Pledge of Allegiance, they did, you know, ceremonial stuff. And then they did their consent agenda. You know what a consent agenda is? In Robert's Rules of Order, it says you can only talk about one thing at a time. Right? A consent agenda is when you gather up a whole lot of administrative things into one motion. So all, you know, approval of minutes, approval of claims, blah, blah, blah. They put in there approval of a contract, a contract extension for 30 days. Put it all into this consent agenda and make one motion, one action, and to adopt all those disparate things in that, that motion. Then they took public comment. Ah. So what happened was a lady who had passions about that extension of a contract, it was for an animal shelter and it's a big story, but she wanted to comment about that contract extension that they had just decided moments ago. And now she's allowed the opportunity to comment about that and the final action was already taken. So she's up there with her manifesto. She's reading through it. It's like two pages. And they have a three minute time limit for public comment. So after about three, three and a half minutes, the mayor wraps the gavel and says, ma'am, uh, could you wrap it up? Your time's up. And about four, ma'am, please, can you finish up? Your time's up. Four and a half minutes, ma'am, your time's up. Please yield the floor. About four and a half minutes, yield the floor or we'll have you removed from the chambers. And then finally she instructs the plainclothes police officer to uh, remove her from the, the, the chambers. So the cop comes over, takes up her papers, uh, doesn't grab her, but kind of takes her by the arm to escort her from the room. She turns around and punches him in the groin. <laughs> Apparently that doesn't go over well with police officers in Great Falls. <laughs> so the rodeo ensues and the guy videotaping this, you know, these little things, he sees what's coming. And he's like, oh, I don't want to be a YouTube sensation tomorrow. So he goes with the cameras and points it away. Now later in court, the judge says that was spoilation of evidence. So big rodeo ensues, they drag her out, you know, she gets arrested for disturbing the peace, assaulting a police officer and a few other things. She sues for violation of her constitutional right because she had a right to comment prior to final action. The judge agreed with her saying you are correct, each one of these things should have been a trigger for the city. They, they failed to ensure that your constitutional rights were met, uh, awarded her $500,000 and everything that happened after they took that motion to adopt the consent agenda was the responsibility of the city. So her charges for disturbing the peace and assaulting an officer were all dropped. So she had no consequences and, uh, and was given a check. And the, the ironic thing was, is you look at her statement, which was in the court proceedings, and where this whole kerfluffle happened, and it was she had like about half a paragraph left, about three sentences, and she would have been done and would have sat down. So, not that the mayor would have known that. The mayor wouldn't have known that. Uh, so, so that's a learning experience for them, that how important it is to make sure. Now, had, had that not been such a big kerfluffle that she would, you know, been charged and say, look, I'm not at fault here. Had, had they just let her blow the, the wind out of her sails and finish her, her manifesto and sit down, she probably wouldn't have sued. They probably wouldn't have gone to court. It's one of those things that if you're acting as a bad actor, it's really a big heavy lift to hold the local government accountable. They could probably sit and scream all day long saying, look, you should allow us to comment prior to the consent agenda being adopted. They're like, yeah, whatever, right? Until this happens, I guarantee you now that has been shifted on their, on their agenda. So I apologize if I missed this. Was there a time limit on comment? Three minute time limit on comment. And so then where, what, what kind of legal weight does that have? <laughs> Good question. How many of you have time limits for your comment, public comment? A few of you. Anybody less than three minutes? Okay, so in, in working with the city and county attorneys across the state, we've, they've all pretty much agreed if you go less than three minutes, you're cruising for a bruising. You're likely going to get some sort of a lawsuit saying, look, you're, you're not giving me adequate time to, to, to comment here. Right, so three minutes is the bare minimum. Five minutes is better, seven minutes everyone's ecstatic. Right? So some of you, how many of you even have anyone show up at your meetings? meetings yeah. yeah. So it's not ne necessarily a problem. So right now there's nothing in the law. So there's nothing here, 
here or here that says one way or the other about limiting the time of public comment. So at this point, we're kind of out there loosey-goosey. That's why I say if you're not making it less than three minutes, uh, people have been okay with it. Now, you don't want to be the jurisdiction that screws this up. And that was the big fear with Great Falls is that this was going to be an indictment on the time limit. And the judge didn't deal with the time limit at all. So, so far, we're still out there able to use time limits. My fear is if it ever goes to court and someone says, look, you're limiting my, my right to redress my, con my government through the Constitution, and my guess is that the Supreme Court will probably side on their side. And then we will lose the opportunity to limit comment. Back here. Do you cover your butt, so to speak, with that and saying, uh, and advising people if they're going to make public comment, say if it's going to go over three or three and a half minutes, uh, please bring in uh, a written thing and it will go into the record and then we have your comment in writing? Yeah, so that would be a way in which you, so oftentimes you can kind of negotiate with the public, particularly if you've got a lot of people there. Uh, Dan, Daniel Chemis, uh, you know who he is? I hope so. <laughs> so he was, he was a master at this uh, from stories told. He would sit there in those meetings, get a lot of, not that Missoula ever has contentious meetings, uh, but this is back, I guess, in the wild days, you get a room full of people and he'd say, okay, before we're doing com public comment on this, we'll be here all night. We don't have all night to do this. So how many of you want to comment in favor of this, this particular action? And they'd raise their hand and say, okay, how much time is it going to take for you guys to get your point across to us? And then he would negotiate with them what that time would be. All right, now who's opposed to this? How much time do you need? So he would negotiate and say, okay, you guys got 15 minutes, you guys got 15 minutes, we're gonna take a recess for 10 minutes, let you guys get your arguments put together, and then we'll come back, we'll hear what you have to say. Right, so that's one way in which you can do that. That's compl completely legitimate. Uh, the other thing you can, you can, in your rules of procedure, if you're going to limit comment, make sure you have the backing of your policy. That you've actually said, we have embraced this in our policy, and uh, our, our limit is going to be this, but also give yourself an out that said with the majority of the, of the board, we can extend the time, we can waive the time, but once you do that, you can't say, I'm going to waive the time for you, but you, mm, I don't like what you're going to say, we're going to hold you to three minutes, <laughs> right? Now you're being arbitrary and you're going to be certainly potential for, for liability there. So, so do it at the beginning and say, look, we're, we've got one person, uh, well, what, well I, I move that we, uh, we uh, waive the, the time limit for the public comment. And, or say, we're going to give you 10 minutes if you want, want to use it, right? Because sometimes it's a very complicated issue. And, and maybe three minutes isn't sufficient for me to talk about some big subdivision that's going in my neighborhood. Now it's going to affect me and traffic flows and, and my kids and school and taxes and all that. Well, it's a big complicated issue. Three minutes may not be sufficient time for me to really share that with with you to help you understand and clarify for you as a decision maker how your decision may impact us in the neighborhood. So, so be thoughtful about giving sufficient time for those complicated issues. In to what you're just talking about there, now the, the example you gave was pro 15 minutes, con 15 minutes. Does that mean that just that group has 15 minutes as a group or each individual in that group has 15 minutes? When he did it was that group. So they had the caucus for 10 minutes to figure out who's going to say what. Uh, or who's going to, you know, we're going to get us four, we'll get up there and these are the things we we'll say, yeah, we all agree with that, great. So they would have to work out as a group of people what they were going to say during that 10 minutes. Yeah, or 15 or but isn't it true though, that if all 200 people wanted to speak, you have to give them the right to speak? Yep, yeah. I, so be cautious about that. Uh, and if they can all agree to that, so does everybody agree with that? But yeah, so then you have to go back to that three minute time limit. Yeah. So, that's, so it, you, you just got to manage it carefully and be thoughtful about how you do that. Make sure that your policies, your rules of procedure that you have, or your bylaws, reflect whatever you plan to do. For me, I never wanted to limit. We, uh, we had in our policies a time limit, but we didn't, because uh, no one ever showed up. And when they did, we wished we would have honored it because, <laughs> you know, we had some people that weren't always balanced. Mm -hmm. They'd come in and they would, we had, oh gosh, we had one gal came in and fired us all. It was all I could do to keep the council from getting up and walking out. I said, Jim, I'm out of here then. I'm fired. Good. I'm gone. Uh, yeah, that didn't go over very well, that meeting. All right. Yes? So if you have open the public comment and have a public comment, and then somebody else has a public comment, how many times are you going to let the other person who already had the right to talk in public comment? Can you, because it'll just keep going. 
Yeah, so you don't want to have this, you know, two people in the room and they get up to say something, the other gets up and they just go back. No, no. So you can say, look, here's your chance to say what you have to say, uh, but you don't get a second bite at the apple. So you can have some of those ground rules. So one of the things, if you've ever walked to the city council chambers down here across the road, what's in, as, before you walk in the room or the ch council chambers, what's on the wall there? A pretty pr framed picture. Rules. Ground rules, right? So you have those ground rules. And that could be one of those ground rules that you have there. Uh, I'm looking up here at the podium and it says, we respect that you, res uh, we, re uh, we request that you respect the following public comment guidelines. And then there's four or five different points. So if you come up here, it says state your name and address, all that stuff. So you, what you're doing is you're defining for the public what your expectations are for their engagement with you. If you don't define those expectations, they will come with their own, which may or may not align with what you want. So the more clearly you can articulate, this is what we expect from you, this is what we need from you to help us make good decisions on your behalf, define it for them, and they'll be more likely per, to fall within that confines or that framework, then it's a free-for-all. Go ahead. Um, just, well, since we're on public comment, can you explain, there's been some confusion on when, when a person gets up to public comment and they're asking a direct question and expecting a response from either the, the board or the council or a presenter that's presenting an item, does, does a response have to be given or is it just public comment? Love that question. Uh, what does the law say? I don't know. <laughs> So the, the citizens have the, right, uh, they have the right to comment prior to final action. Now, that's, now, they may choose to comment in the form of 50 questions. You are not obligated to respond to those 50 questions, right? You can if you will, or if you want, right? It's, it's, it's at your own peril, so to speak. What we don't want to see is the meeting devolve into a debate back and forth between the person, because you'll probably never get out of that. I'm going to respond to your question back and forth. You could, you could say, look, you've asked some very valid questions. Now's not the time for us to address all those questions. If you'd like to meet with me after the meeting or tomorrow during my office hours or whatever, we can go through your list of questions, respond to that in, in a different manner than here in the public meeting. Here, we are to receive comment about how, you know, comment on this particular issue prior to us taking final action, right? And if it looks like there's a whole lot of unrest within the community, a lot of misunderstanding, right, because they just came from the coffee shop where we all know everything is extremely accurate at the <laughs> coffee shop, right? Now they come thinking, oh my goodness, you're going to raise my taxes by a third, you're going to take my firstborn, which I'd be happy to give him to you. But so they come with these different expectations, what the reality is, right? And so, so here's a way in which we can address that. Uh, let's do this, uh, a way to help fix that, that concern that I just raised. Here's one way in which you can a, a, a approach your public comment. So here's, this is going to be your agenda. Uh, okay, agenda item number one. And it's, uh, this is what I suggest you do. It's, it's X, Y, Z, right? So we're going to have an informational presentation. We're going to have the, the planner. We're going to have the engineer. We're going to have someone present the information, the data. Here's the facts. This is what the issue is. This is what we're uh, proposing to do. Uh, this is how we've anticipated impacting people. So all that information is going to be presented out there. So those people that come all wound up from the coffee shop, they're going to hear that presentation like, oh, well, that's all it is. Or it's like, oh, I kind of see where they're going here. They may not like it. Rest assured, they may not like it. But now they're starting to understand what it is, what you plan to do, how it's going to affect them. Right? That allows them, when they engage in the public comment, to engage in a much more meaningful way because they have all the information. Nothing worse oh, than being caught by your, ah, it's gonna. That would be like a funny cat video, wouldn't it? <laughs> nothing what was, what was nothing worse? Nothing worse, oh, nothing worse than you being a governing body and having all these 50 questions of inaccurate things or their comments are like way off base. It's like, do you not understand what we're, what we're doing here, right? There's this disconnect between the public and what you're doing. That's never a good sign. So you have this informational presentation. Then what I would suggest you do is have a Q and A session where the, the board is asking questions of whoever the expert is or asking questions amongst themselves. 
And if you're smart as a board, you're asking the questions that you think the public are coming here with concerns. You may know the answer, but you want to make sure that it's clearly articulated to the public where they understand and get it as best you can. Does that make sense? So a Q&A going on, you can decide whether you want to allow the public to Q&A during that time too. That's up to you. Can, there's nothing saying you can't, but you may lose control of the meeting pretty quick. All right, so you have your Q&A, uh, and then now with all that context there, all that understanding and clarity hopefully being generated, then you allow the public comment. Right, so now the public understands the issue and that make, allows them to make, allows their comment to be much more constructive and impactful and meaningful because they have all the data and information ahead of time. And it helps you as the decision maker with that clarity to have them to present things that maybe you hadn't thought about yourself. All right, next thing I would suggest would be the motion. So after public comment, you make the motion, right? The motion then uh, gets a second, and then what do you do after the motion? Discussion. discussion. So, so now the board discusses it. What I'm going to say, eh, yeah, you can decide how you want to do this. I'm going to draw a line right here. This I would consider the public process. This would be the process of the deliberative body. And, and then you take the, the, the discussion and then uh, action. Now some will say, the public will say, well gosh, now that I've heard the motion, I have more to say to comment. Right? And they want to come back in here and comment after there. Some jurisdictions will do that. They'll allow public comment here. So one comment here to frame the motion and one comment here to help frame the discussion and how we take action on it. Now if you got that kind of time, have at it. But you'll be there till 2 in the morning for your first agenda item. Uh, so another way to get help with this is what you could do is up here, the motion, the stat, so, so this might work really well with the planning board or board of adjustments. That you have the staff is making a recommendation and we recommend that you approve this or not approve this, right? Or, so what they would have up here would be proposed language for a motion. And then on the side it might be approve, amend, or reject. So on the agenda that's noticed for the public, they kind of get a sense of where you're headed relative to this particular motion. Then that might help frame this conversation here. Then it allows you the flexibility that we might want to amend it based on public comment to reflect better what's going on with the community and what the staff thinks and then we can make our action. Does that make sense? Very few of you that might, this, this level of complexity might not relate to all of you, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, but that's one way in which you can make sure that, that people understand what's going on. You're going through the process. It's very uh, transparent. People can weigh in. All right. Uh, did we get the public comment? What else do we want to talk about public comment? What other questions do you have on public comment other than what we've covered so far? If you have a meeting where there isn't any public there, and you, I mean, we always have public comment at the beginning on our agenda, but if you don't ask for public comment, ask It's another great question. So what you could do on your agenda, uh, what I would suggest you do is, well, there's many ways you can do this. No right way as long as you make sure that certain principles are met. So very beginning of the meeting, before you do any, take any action, any motion that requires a second and an action, you make sure public comment takes place. Some jurisdictions do public comment on agenda at the beginning of the meeting. And then they'll allow public comment not on agenda but within jurisdiction at the end of the meeting. So your meeting is bookmarked by public comment. This is your chance to speak about anything that's going to be on the agenda. Now that the agenda is over, what else do you want to talk about public? And we will take that under advisement and decide how we want to deal with that moving forward. So in a way it kind of allows the public an opportunity to help shape your agenda moving forward as an organization. We always did with staff senate even if there was no public present. Yeah. So yep. then we had it in the minutes that we requested comment on the agenda and then at the end. And it's right on your agenda so then and just put it as part of your boilerplate agenda so that the board chair always asks, is there any public comment? You know, no, see no public comment, we'll go ahead and do a, a, agenda item number one. And so you can split those. You can do public comment for each thing you're taking a motion on or lump it all together yes. and say let's do our public comment. 
that's the next thing. So you could do public comment on each agenda item one, one agenda item two, PC, you know, public comment on each one of those, mm -hmm. right? You could, some even are, they'll do this, all of these. Some will just say, you know what, we're going to do all of our public comment here. We'll do public comment on the agenda and public comment on, 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 on the jurisdiction out there too. So here's your chance, folks, be in the meeting. Anything that's on the agenda, not on the agenda, here's your chance to speak, right? So, go ahead. As long as you've asked for that, if you looped it all together and before any vote, you've met your requirements. You, yeah. So far that that, that, would, that would work and meet the muster today for allowing the public to comment prior to final action. Yeah. And allowing them to comment on anything not on, uh, on the agenda within the jurisdiction, which you saw in 23103 or whatever it was, or 203 we read earlier. Yeah. Real quick, somebody that comes in late after your public comment on the agenda and you've gone through all that and then they're later and you say general comments and they want to go back to the agenda but they came in half hour later or whatever, how were they? I'll let you use your discretion on that, yeah. So ag again, what, what was the, I'll go back, mm. 23103, each agency shall develop procedures for permitting and, encur and encouraging Permitted and encouraging. So, so you've got to think philosophically, right? Back to those principles of good governance. Uh, do we want to have a procedural thing prevent someone from really engaging the process? Right? Is that what's going to rule us? Or we really are interested in making sure that we make good decisions? And then how do we allow ourselves the flexibility within the process and structure that we've created to allow good governance to happen? That's my goal. At the end of the day, we want good governance to happen. But we need to have a framework and structure to operate in, but it has to be flexible enough to make sure at the end we got good governance. Quick related question on encouragement, because a lot of times you have these meetings and you can get five or six loudest voices in the room, and then you've got the silent majority that are kind of the other side, but a little bit more ambivalent, or yeah. how, do, how do you try to balance that and encourage people that are you know, Oh, no. Yeah, I hear you, I hear you. All right. Whew. That's where this part right here is critical. This discussion part of your motions. So yeah, you've got five people, the biggest cranks in town, and they're just grinding on you really hard, but you know that the rest of the community doesn't necessarily reflect those five individuals' values or interests here. So it's in that public, in that discussion of the motion, and you articulate, this is the rationale, this is the reasons why we're making this decision. All the, and, you, and you honor them, say, yeah, although we hear what you're saying, but this we feel is more important. We're looking 20 years down the road, and by making this decision today, it's going to position us well for being where we want to be in 20 years, right? And we recognize that what you're saying is going to hurt, it's going to be sacrificed. Yeah, we get that, but this is where we need to be, so we've got to make those sacrifices to get there. Well, as a board member, you're also a community member, so you can articulate that as part of the moderate position process. Yep. And it's all out there. And so they may not necessarily like, what, what really fire them up is they spend this passionate plea of being the cranks as they are in the public comment, make the motion, no discussion, and action. And they're saying, did you not hear what we just said? You just, you know, we're the only people in the room. And they need to recognize that just because you're the only people in the room, it's not, huh, it's not an election. We're not counting noses how many people said yes. And, you know, think about that on, on I don't want to adult. One thing that to understand, like federal land use, and they oftentimes the paper report, they have 22,000 comments about XYZ decision or NEPA process or whatever. Those 22,000 comments might have been all the same form letters. Mm -hmm. And the agency, they get those same 22,000 comments of the same issue, and they address the issue in their report, it's done. It doesn't matter whether it's one or 22,000, it's seen as one comment. Does that, does that make sense? So, so, so we, anyway, so that's, that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to address the issue, whether it's 50 people or it's one person, the, the, the issue's been addressed. This is the comments and figuring out how much they have in common and if there's some variance in there. And if you got the five cranks that all have the same issue, it's one issue, yeah. no matter how loud they shout. And if you address it, it's, a, it's been addressed. So it's, I think it's, that this is part of that transparency and openness. It make, this is kind of hard stuff. It's, it's, you, you really got to be, Put yourself out there and operate a little bit different than what we're used to. In the business world, you just make the decision and like it or lump it. If you don't like it, you don't patron my business. We don't see at Walmart, they posting, hey, we're going to create our new budget this week. Come on in and comment. You know, it doesn't happen. Uh, they say the prices are the prices. If you don't like it, go somewhere else, right? But that's not the case here, right? Because you don't have an option. 
If you don't like your streets the way they're getting plowed, you don't have an option to go with their competitor. Or I don't like the water service or the sewer service or the whatever, the parks. I, can, I have no other options. So government, what we do in government, it, government's designed to do collectively what we can't do individually. Right? I can't manage a, a transportation system by myself. So we all got to work together to create a transportation system that's going to work for everybody. And that's that collective. Right? Um, it's not bad. Oh, commentary, sorry. We'll move on. Okay. Uh, does that help with the, with the agenda making? Now, let's quickly in, oh my goodness. What constitutes a meeting? What is the frame, or what are the, there's six things that makes a meeting, and you might want to use, some of them are, we've talked about them already. Uh, look on page three, two, three, two, oh, two. But in order to have a legal meeting, what criteria needs to be met? What needs to happen in order to have a legal meeting? What do you need? Quorum. A quorum. All right, so we have a quorum. What else? Notification. Notice. Seven days prior to. So, say it again. Seven days prior to. Oh, yeah, so let, 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 let's talk about that. Uh, uh, time. Right now, let's just do it right now. What would be considered adequate notice? Right? The, the law said and the Constitution said that thou shalt provide adequate notice prior to final action. What constitutes adequate notice? Depends on what you're yeah, so, so how long of a notice should you provide the public prior to your meeting? Your it's in your policy. <laughs> Just read your policy. <laughs> so what would the policy say if we were to read the policy? <laughs> 48 hours, thank you. So the, the law, the, well, that's not the law. There's nowhere in that law, if you read that purple sheet, there's nowhere in there does it say 48 hours, right? So a bunch of uh, city and county attorneys said, oh, gosh, we don't know what would be adequate notice, and we don't want to screw up and, and go through a big expensive lawsuit. So they went to the attorney general and said, could you please give us an interpretation when it says in the Constitution the law, adequate notice. The attorney general came back with 48 hours would be sufficient notice prior to final action, but, <laughs> but should increase with the relative importance of the decision being made. Uh, more ambiguity, <laughs> right? What's, what would that be? So, so, uh, so land use decision. Now, as I'm there, if you're on the planning board, there's other criteria, there's certain things within Title 76 that says if you're going to make this decision, you need two weeks notice, right? Land use is a little bit different than other general decisions that we're making in a governing body because we're changing the landscape likely forever. So we want to make sure that we're going to give you two weeks before that decision's made, but that's the thing is we, there's certain uh, criteria that's different in land use decisions than with just normal boards. Uh, so 48 hour notice according to the, according to the attorney general. So that's another one of those things that if you're doing it in 24 hours, it's not because we don't know what the answer is. Here's the other thing here is if we were to add up uh, attorney general opinions and Supreme Court cases, just little snippets, little, a uh, couple sentences that explain attorney general opinions and Supreme Court cases, this number comes up to 32 pages now of information that clarifies what those three sentences mean. So three sentences to 32 pages. Like I said, we, we should know now what's going on uh, with that. All right, so we're down to two. We got two. Quorum, notice. An agenda. We need an agenda. What else? Minutes. Minutes. We need, ooh, minutes. Yeah, there's a law in there, but that's not a requirement. Time, place would be notice. We're up to four, right? Right. Oh, what did we just have a big conversation about just minutes ago? Public comment. Public comment. All right, and then the last one usually is a hard one. Two three two o oh, two. Middle of top of that page three. Okay, it says uh, to hear. Discuss or act, right? You see that? Now, why did I make such a big deal about the or? You don't have to act. 
Yeah. It could be any one of those three things, right? So if you have a quorum of your board that's discussing something that's not been noticed, you don't have an agenda, the public's not uh, able to comment, are you having a meeting that's inconsistent with the law? Yeah. yeah. If you're hearing, so for example, the, the, the classic example, you're sitting at the high school gym watching the f basketball game, and there's three of you on the planning board sitting there and, of the five member board, and someone comes up to you and says, hey, I've been wondering, I've been wanting to talk to you about that new proposed subdivision going in XYZ place. Right? You've got a quorum, and someone comes up to hear, or, is, or you're as a board hearing input, now suddenly you've turned into a meeting. Right? That requires a notice, you have a quorum, you need an agenda, you need minutes, so that's not a good thing, because now the rest of the public is saying, hey, there's three board members up there on this, you know, what are they talking about? Are they talking about that new controversial development going in? What are they, what's going on there? I got a call the other day from a former council member who said, hey, is the law still true? <laughs> you always love it when they start with that. Uh, I was at the bar the other day, and it was right after the city council meeting, and three council members of the mayor came in, sat down in the corner, and they were huddled over there talking after the council meeting. Is that still good? And I said, no, that's not good. <laughs> how do, what she, you know, we talked about how she can gently remind the mayor that, uh, that that type of activity is not good. It doesn't look good. For all we know, they could have been talking about Fishing. fishing, you know, fishing or something. We don't know, but what does it look like to everyone else? And likely they weren't talking about fishing. Because appearance of impropriety is enough. Is enough. To, it's enough to erode the trust, right? And that's the key thing. All you have is that trust between you and the public. You erode that trust and the transaction costs go up. See, already now she's wondering, what are they talking about? What's going on? What's happening without our ability to participate? So she's already distrusting the point where she's calling me to complain about it, right? So that's not bode well for that community. And they're in the midst of a very controversial three years. Uh, we've been there several times working with them in the community because there's this mountain of problems there. All right, so these are the, the criteria you have to meet a meet, have a meeting. So make sure that each one of those are happening when you meet and that you're not meeting with one of those missing. So how does that apply towards email communication? <sighs> yes. Uh, it's on the list. So that Email is going to be your biggest problem because you can create a quorum. What I would suggest is any information that goes out is a one way. Woo, is one way. Uh, so, for example, the board president, chairperson, or the staff member says, "Here's the agenda and the packet for the for the upcoming meeting," and one of the board members hits reply all and says, "I see on the agenda we're going to discuss this at." Agenda and I have number three, and this is what I talked to Bob there on Main Street, and he said this and this and this and this is what I think we got to do. What just happened? We had a meeting via email. We're discussing something of public interest and no notice. So you can ask questions. Does the meeting start at 7 or 7.30? That's fine. That's administrative. But if you're talking about anything of substance, anything within your legislative purview, that would be off limits. So be very careful about how you use email. We had one not far from here, actually. We had one airport board that got a big FAA grant. And they said, great, we're going to do this whole big project. And they literally went underground. They went in their basements, and they spent six months emailing back and forth and developing this wonderful plan about how they're going to use this big old grant to redo their entire airport. And then they surfaced after six months of not hearing a word from them, and they had a big announcement saying, we're going to release the, our, our master plan and move forward. And the county attorney called up and said, you can't do that. And they said, watch us. And they got in a big fight. And they called us in. We did this big. And we, it took us two hours to convince these guys that that was not consistent with the law, the Constitution. And they eventually had to start the process all over. They, the comment they said was, it's, we're busy, and we don't have the time, and this is more efficient to do it this way. Well, you've just compromised the entire integrity of a democracy. Right? This is not about you and about if, if you're too busy, well, to get off the board and put someone else on that, you know. So step up, do your job the way it's designed to be done. And since you have federal grant money, you're legally compelled yeah. to follow Oh, more stories I can tell you about federal grant money and that, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so those, that's your criteria. Oh, ex parte communication. Oh, did I finish all this? So that's your electronic. Uh, records retention is going to be your other big pain in the butt, is you've got to retain all those emails because the public has a right to see them. Go ahead. 
you have your basic board out in the meeting, you have your core, quote, quote. In that particular meeting, you develop a committee to decide or research a certain project, which also is including all of the members that are voting members of this board. Now, is that meeting that's going to be held to research, should the water be turned off at 5 o'clock or whatever, supposed to be open to the public too? And are the minutes supposed to be kept on that committee's meeting? So did everybody hear that? Mm -hmm. So you have, in your board, creates a subcommittee for whatever purpose, right? And it might be two members and three members of the public come together. We want you to, to labor on this issue. If it is a, a subdivision of your board and it is an official act of your board to create them, they are an official board, that all this criteria needs to be met. That subcommittee needs to notice their meetings they need to follow your board policies, meet, notice the meetings, have an agenda, allow public comment. All that stuff needs to take place as well. And yeah, and if that subcommittee creates a subcommittee, guess what? That subcommittee has to do it as well. So any subdivision of government, this all applies to them. Is it a quorum of the members of that committee or subcommittee or a quorum of the members of the whole board? Great question. So if the board creates a sub-board, that board becomes a governing body of its own, and that would be the quorum of that board. So if you say we're only going to put two members of this five-member board on that committee, so there we don't have a quorum, and therefore we don't need to, that's, that's not the case, because that, that board that you just created is a, its own governing body now, a, a subdivision of your body. And you've given them s specific expectations and duties to report back. Yeah. Uh, gosh, all these hands, well, this is great. Yes, yes, and that, that subdivision, that subcommittee should be approving their minutes and then passing them on up with their recommendations to the main board. Uh, so th this is actually addressing a lot of what I was concerned about with the ex parte. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to clarify a couple of things that just came up. Uh, email communication, based on what you said, if, 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 there's, a, if, if there's a reply all amongst uh, a board, then, then you're having uh, you're having an ad hoc meeting, which is not okay, but one-on-one -on -one communications via email, that is like meeting somebody at the bar, right? Yes, so here's, the, here's gonna be the rub. Uh, anything that you guys are doing on behalf of that public board is gonna be considered public record. So if you are using your personal email, and I'll just go a little to the side here, if you're using your personal email account as your main communication mode within that board, and something happens, and you're sued, say, and the uh, other folks, the other attorneys want discovery, they want to see all the email communication about that particular issue, even if it's just between you and I, as two board members, you're discussing, as an official board member, discussing an official potential act or action that took place, uh, they will want to see that, to see the evolution of that decision that, that took place. They could then ask for all the emails relative to that, and likely what will happen is they'll ask for your email address and password, and then you've got some attorney, likely your attorney will have to go through all of your emails to decide whether that is a public email or a private email. Public or private. And now you're spending a whole gosh awful lot of money for some attorney there with a Sharpie to go through all your emails. So what I would suggest you do is you create your own little Gmail account that this is only for public business, my role on this board. So the library board, uh, seat one, seat two, seat three, and that's gonna go out, that's what we'll use. So if there's any ever, any, ever any question, then that whole board can turn that over and say all of our official communication and interactions has been done on this email account, nothing has gone on my private account, and then you can keep a firewall between you and your public service. Because I don't, I, I don't have anything to hide, but I certainly don't want anybody just creeping around in my private life. And the other part is it's just terribly expensive to have them do that. So does that help? So, uh, so and then the ex parte communication, particularly if you're on a planning board where you are in a quasi-judicial mode, which means you're quasi or like a judge. So the planning board oftentimes is sitting as a judge. They say, here's the, the planning or the, the, the developer's proposal. Here's what our subdivision regulations say. Have they met all those regulations sufficient? And we are making judgment on that. You're not a legislator where you're using legislative judgment. You are being a judge 
saying, is it accurate and does it represent what we've laid out as our rules, right? And that's a quasi-judicial mode, and when you're in that mode making the decision and determination, then you can't have this, what they call, ex parte communication, right? Like a judge, you don't want to have a judge sit down with the, the defense attorney and have lunch and talk about the case without the other prosecuting attorney being there, right? So if you're having communication with, say, the developer while his development application is active and you're in that quasi-judicial mode, now you're having communication that is inappropriate that no other decision maker is having access to that information. Does that make sense? So now you have information no one else has. And that's now created an imbalance and it's unfair in the process. So we want to make sure this is fair so that ex parte communication is important that you say, look, developer, I, I can't talk to you or people in the street, look, we have a hearing, come to the hearing, talk to us. And if people insist on saying, hey, this is what I want to say, I can't go to the meeting, then you've got to disclose that information back at the hearing. So you've got to disclose any communication you've had outside of the official process so that everyone in the decision making process has access to that information. Uh, interesting. So, so if, if there is ex parte communication, then, it, then as long as you retroactively enter that into the public record, you're all right. Yeah, you, d you need to disclose that. I don't know if I'm all right, but you need, <laughs> you need to disclose as best you can. This is, I've heard, people call me, this is what they've said. And, and the other thing is, anonymous stuff, not a fan. If you're not willing to put your name to a comment, you got to own your citizenship, right? This is tough stuff. You've got to own your citizenship. So if you say, well, don't use my name, but this is how I feel, that's great, but I'm not going to share that with anybody unless you want to come forward. Then I'll use your name, whatever. Write it up, sign it, and we'll, we'll enter it into the record. That's my deal. That's just, a, it's a philosophy that I have that you've got it. Anyway, don't get me started. <laughs> is that good? That is, the other part of that was, um, uh, well, actually, not, not part of that, something else that, that came up. Uh, is it then okay to have a discussion regarding something that came up in non-agenda public comment? Say it again. So, 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 so you have your non-agenda, you, you have your uh, public comment on non-agenda items. Something comes up. Yeah. Then can, can the board then discuss that? I, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, you can discuss it. Uh, decide what you want to do with it, uh, but you, you try to get your head around it, but I wouldn't go too far into discussing the merits of it, but just try to get your head around it might be something, and then say, let's put that on a future meeting agenda that we can really drill into it and get, yeah, but no actions taken. So the other thing is, you can't, I have a concern about adding, where am I at, adding things to your agenda after the meeting starts, that things pop up and we're going to add it to the agenda. Shouldn't do that unless it's had 48 hour notice. So once that 48 hours notice has happened, you've got the agenda out and you're noticing your locations, then you're locked in. That's what you're going to talk about. Something comes up in the meantime, sorry, we'll have to put that on the next meeting agenda or if it's really important, we'll have to convene a special meeting to, to discuss that issue. If you have a special meeting, it still requires a 48 hour notice, right? You just can't say, we'll have a special meeting tomorrow. Well, that won't work because you need the 48 hour notice. So, so regardless of what you do, you still need the 48 hour notice you're more than willing, more than happy to allow you, or the, the, the law allows you to have as many special meetings as you want uh, in between your normal meetings as long as you're noticing them. So what, <laughs> what has to be done? So do you have to use a newspaper? So you got a newspaper that's once a week, and then you also have your... Uh, you don't need, uh, so there's certain things that require a notice in the newspaper, and that's hearings. But a regular meeting doesn't, isn't required to go into a newspaper. My guess is what I would suggest you do is get with the county and say, what is your noticing policy for noticing meetings? And then adopt that same noticing policy so that there's consistency across the board. Now, with you guys, like the fire district, uh, are you close by? Uh, not really. Well, so, so it might be that you... You'll still want to notice at your fire hall, you know, whatever you're within your district, you might want to make sure you're noticed. It wouldn't hurt to have it also noticed at the courthouse, in the public library. You can't do too much notice, right? But at least, I would suggest at least three places of notice where it's a physical, here is our agenda, and that agenda should be a level of specificity so that the public can say, oh, I want to attend or not attend based on what the agenda says. So what I love it, with, dang, you didn't hear that. What I love it is when they have on their meeting agenda, they say fire truck. 
<laughs> what does that mean? And you get there and you realize, oh, they just bought a quarter, a quarter million dollar fire truck today. And, and, and that's how you noticed us, that you're going to spend a quarter million of our tax dollars in this district on a fire truck, and all you said on the agenda was, fire truck? That gets you about a quarter of a fire truck. Right? Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's used. It's used. But so, that, so that's, the, that's the deal. I, I think it should be sufficient there uh, in, in the notice in that agenda that the, the purchase of a used fire truck. Right or a quarter of a fire truck that, uh, but 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 that should be enough there that the public says, okay, I know what they're going to talk about, and I can decide whether I want to engage or not. Does that make sense? So you're not going to add anything. You're going to be a, a level of specificity so people know if they want to participate or not. Uh, that kind of deals with that minutes. You need to capture in those minutes those things that were heard, discussed, and acted on. There's a it's two three. Uh, 211, I think, in your in that. Uh, so, so the meeting is what you hear, discuss, or act on, and those minutes need to reflect. And the law says the substance of, <coughs> right? <coughs> verbatim is not necessary. So, verbatim minutes is not is not necessary. But action items or an action agenda is uh, or action minutes is insufficient. Where it's motion. Act, uh, vote, motion, vote, motion, vote is not sufficient. You want to have enough explanation about the content and the context of what, the, what went behind the decision that was made. So if you're the minute taker, think about yourself in 10 years from now, looking back at the decisions that you made at that board meeting, and would I know what's going on and why the board made the decision they did by reading those minutes? Right? That's always been my <coughs> litmus test. Would I get it? Would I understand? Because believe me, I've had to read a bucket load of minutes, you know, back 30 years trying to figure out when, I love it when people come in and say, well, the city promised us that they would put the extension of the sewer line 500 yards to our house back in 83. I doubt they did. We'll go back and read every one of those meeting minutes to see whether we did or not. And if they did, then we figure out how we'd own up to that. If they didn't, it should say it in those meetings. Or it, it should say whether we did in those meeting minutes. So, Reading those minutes, you get a sense of like, oh, this is awful, or these were fantastic. And like, I get it, I understand what went in. And sometimes you wonder, why did they make that decision? You go read the minutes, like, oh, okay, now I get it. Today it doesn't make sense, but in the content, context of, of that time, it made sense. Uh, was there another hand? Well, I was going to ask you, it's the worst topic on the planet. Uh, but a lot of this electronic communication, agenda minutes, announcement, um, it's written on the board about social media. Yeah. So I don't think we should tweet new policy changes and things like that, but <laughs> possibly, uh, how, how can that help us or hurt us? Uh, social media, if, if done well, can be a help to you. It could also be a nightmare. Uh, and so what I would suggest you do is connect with the county. I think you probably have a social media policy. So I would use that policy, particularly if you're an advisory board, you, need, you, you fall underneath their umbrella. The, the, the fire districts, you may have your own autonomy in creating your own policy around social media. But you may want to have a policy that defines what do we post, how do, are we going to allow comments in a, in, a, in a discussion board or not. There's all those things you really want to consider before you engage in social media. I think it's a very valuable tool in being able to share and, and disclose to the public what's going on. It wouldn't meet sufficient noticing requirements, but it adds to noticing requirements. So noticing you need a physical place or location, but putting it on your website, putting it out on social media, that's all in that encouragement side, right? And, but, and again, the other problem is, is, is this is all a public record. You're a public entity and you're doing things on social media, so you've got to think about a retention policy. How do we save all this stuff? Oh my goodness. So it, it gets pretty unwieldy pretty quick. Uh, it looks great, but it's, it's, it's hard. All your records are open to disclosure, so you need to make sure that you're keeping your minutes safe, a safe place. I think minutes need to be turned into the clerk and recorder's office within four weeks, six weeks, 30 days. 30 days? 30. I think in 30 days, I think it needs to be turned in. That was new since 2015, so, so you've got to send that in to the, the clerk and recorder. Once, so once they're approved, then they need to be dropped off at the clerk and recorder. The, the, the value of that, by the way, is that the clerk recorder then is the official record keeper of your minutes. You should have a copy, but push come to shove, those minutes, that's, that's where, I think that's what the legislature was thinking is we've got so many boards, we've got over a thousand, like 1,300 boards in this state. 
think about that. <laughs> you go to a records request for two years ago and ask some uh, the secretary of a board to say, oh gosh, that was two clerks ago, and it might be in the basement in someone's house that's been flooded. You know, and you lost all that historic records. Is so you, you want to retain those, and it's, the minutes are going to be for perpetuity. Is it 30 days of approval or 30 days of the minutes? I want to say approval. approval. Okay. Yeah, approval. Because some of these might only meet once every you know, yeah, six months exactly. or a year or something. I want to be really clear again on the, you brought up the subcommittees of the boards. If you have a, a an agency or a department that has a working group internally working on a project with, let's say, you know, a client or something, and a board member, you want a board member to be on that committee? So there, the, this is a board that oversees it. A working group on a project, figuring out like a development or something like yeah. that. <laughs> I mean, do you see, is there a nuance between a staff so, and Yeah, so for example, a health department, the health, so you've got a health board, right. and, and then you've got the health department, and you might have a lot of administrative internal things going on here, and they're just looking for the outcome of this process. So uh, unless it's, it, it might be administratively appointed by the health officer who says, look, we're going to do this internally. If the board says we need to create a working group as a subdivision of us, kind of in a political world, not an administrative world, that that would be needing the noticing. If it's an administrative board done by the, the health department, creates this internal organization to come up with something for approval by the board, I, I would see that as different. In the committee meeting, subcommittee, the boards, the notice could be like, for example, following the county policy as far as on the website. It could be on a calendar, a subcommittee of the board. Whatever the policy is of the county, I would say follow that policy, because if you haven't been sued over it, then I will assume it's working. <laughs> <laughs> So but then it just, it just makes it easier to have one, everybody follows the same policy and there's consistency and continuity within the community that people know what to expect, right? So there's not 12 or 15 different ways in which we'll find meeting notices based on the different boards. I don't know, we got through everything. Uh, social media chair, the role of the chair. Here's one other thing I'll just say on the chair. How many chairpersons are in the room? Here's what I would suggest for chairpersons. You are there to facilitate the meeting but you have every right and privilege of being a board member. Okay, so this is gonna be in conflict with Robert's rules, but, but I don't think you should be prevented from being able to discuss, being able to make motions, because you are a board member, just like every other board member, right? So by uh, acquiescing your legislative responsibility because you were made the board, I don't think is fair to you, because you are on that board because you're bringing a certain perspective and knowledge and experience to that board that we don't want to have that lost because you're the one that has to run the meeting. You've got to figure out how do I run that meeting without overbearing the meeting, but you want to, you want to run that meeting and you can participate as well. Does that make sense? Now, how practice is harder than, it's easier for me to say it in 30 minutes, 30 seconds. But. Um, past experience had a board member that we would all vote on, we would discuss, we would do everything we're supposed to do, vote on it, even that person voted yes, and then two meetings later came back with the same situation and wanted to go for it again. Where do we stand on second like yeah. that? So they, they, they made a decision, they want to come back and make the decision again? Yes, they wanted to rehash, rehash it, yeah, redo rehash it again. Oh, I'd say asked and answered. Refer to back to the meeting minutes and say we already did it, so yeah. move on. So I'd say, okay, next item. Okay. So it shouldn't, so if, and so that's where if you're, and so the, the board chair also I think would be the one that would create the board yep. agenda, right? So, so in your meeting, uh, roles, of dis, roles of responsibilities, that uh, ground, the, the bylaws, the rules of, uh, Conduct. yeah. In there, you should define who puts together the agenda. So I would suggest it would be, so that would be an executive function, right? Remember the three, and you're helping leave, I'll just keep yapping. The, you, you are a legislative body as a board, but you can give some le, uh, executive function to the board chair in order to conduct business, like creating the agenda. Uh, that would be a responsibility of the board chair. Conducting the meeting would be the responsibility of the board chair. So they give them certain executive responsibilities, but by and large, you're still a legislator on that board. When you have a tie, you need to decide in your rules of procedure how you're going to deal with the tie. My suggestion is you're a board member, unless they give you specific, and I would, would not encourage this, specific 
powers as the board chair to break ties. What happens if there's a tie on the board? In theory, there shouldn't be because there's five members, but say one's absent and it's a 2-2 vote, what happens? It fails because there's no majority. So it just fails. Right now, in a city council and a mayor, that's a whole different thing. And the AGs weighed in, and you know, I can explain that if you care, but I won't burn your time up here. So that's so that's how you operate. I would so you'd be very limited about what kind of executive authority you grant to the chair, but that should all be spelled out in your rules of procedure or your bylaws. Yeah. So Got pretty much conflict of interest. Oh gosh, all this good stuff. Hey, we're doing this again tonight. At what time? Six o'clock if you want to come back and hear more because none of these are the, the two same. So uh, if you want to stick around, we can talk about things. If it was one of your questions up here, we can talk about them. Uh, if not, thanks for coming. Appreciate your service in making Missoula and the county such a great place to be. Good luck uh, and have fun in your service. The last thing I want to say, if you're not having fun doing this, you're not doing it right. <laughs> so have a good afternoon. <laughs>